Hello everyone. Now it's a it's gonna be a pretty hot day today in Rome. Uh, probably in the in the nineties in Fahrenheit, we're you know close to forty in Celsius. And uh, I'm actually headed to a meeting point for a tour, and I'm early as usual, very very early. You know, when I have time, I, I like to come to the center early to see what's going on, you know, the mood, the atmosphere. And uh, of course, I don't want to be late for the tour. And uh, so, yeah, today I decided to take a little walk. And uh, this video is not scripted or anything. It's just, you know, always have my camera with me when I have a chance to shoot something. I always do. And uh, we start today from... Uh, we're starting from Largo di Torre, Argentina. Many of you know it as a cat place or cat's place. It's a cat sanctuary. But not only that, it's actually a very important site, one of the very few Republican archaeological sites in Rome. And it's a really cool place. I mean, we have over 2,000 years of history, probably more, something like 2,300 years of history here in one spot. And this has been, it was buried for a long time, like many archaeological sites. And uh, finally, in the beginning of 20th century, they dug it up, probably because of the construction. You know, there were Romans were rebuilding the city and all this was discovered. Take a look at this. We have ruins of four temples. No one really knows what gods these temples were dedicated to. But we know that, you know, this was always a very important place for Romans. And even today it's called Sacred Place of Argentina or Sacred uh, Square. Uh, Tor Argentina, it has nothing to do with the country, or it has nothing to do with Argentina, contrary to a popular belief. But most likely somewhere over there on the other side, all right, there was a, there was a little palace that belonged to one of the... Uh, one of the members of administration of the Papal States, of the, you know, today we would call it Vatican, and uh, probably, most likely, there was a tower just like that one right there, and it was painted silver. So, Torre Argentina, silver tower. All right, that's how it, that's where it takes uh, its name. We have we have few cats today. You know, it's it's been restored, rebuilt. Uh, restorated uh, and uh, very soon it's going to be open it's going to become available to the public open to the public so next time in Rome make sure to visit this site not only to see the cats but to see the sacred place for Romans and there's another thing all right a cherry on top of your of your Sunday this is the place okay or very this place is let's say very close to a place where Julius Caesar uh, was killed. All right, so if we get over to the other side, there would be a monumental staircase leading up to a uh, an office, or offices actually, a structure, big structure, big building called Curia Pompeiana, or government uh, of Pompey, Pompey the Great, of course. Of course, we're talking late first century uh, BC or BCE to be politically correct. You know that I don't like to be politically correct, but it's a different story. And Julius Caesar, was going to work as usual, right? March 15th. Of course, it was not a usual day because people were talking and uh, he most likely knew what was going to happen to him. I mean, out of 300 members of Senate, 60 at least were plotting his assassination. So, I mean, people were talking. Uh, according to Shakespeare, even his favorite priest and oracle told him you know, not to go to work on that day, basically, you know, to, to hide, or at least to stay home. And Julius Caesar jokingly said that the Ides of March are come. And the priest replied, yes, but not gone, Caesar. And Caesar, of course, learned his lesson. Well, whether Brute was there or not, we don't know. We don't know if Brute was his actually son or adopted son or just business partner or kid of his you know son of his business partner 
most likely he was so shocked to see all these familiar faces, you know, stabbing him. He was stabbed multiple times, over 20 times he was stabbed. And I always say, and I, I like to joke about this, I know there's nothing to joke about, I mean, it's a, it's a murder, all right? But at the same time, you know, I, I tried to find funny things and everything, funny side and everything. And I say that these senators that stabbed them, who stabbed them, they probably had very little experience handling weapons, so they stabbed each other more than they stabbed Caesar. And covered in their own blood, they came out. All right, this probably happened somewhere here, right here. So between La Rodito Argentina and Curia Pompeana. So imagine they dump his body on the street, you know, this very tragic, very dramatic, very theatrical, his dead body, you know, lifeless corpse rolls down the stairs. And all the senators come out chanting, the king is dead, the king is dead. So, you know, they can finally restore democracy in the, in the Roman Republic. And mind you, it was not empire yet, all right? It was still republic. And they were covered in their own blood, and there was this bloody orgy, this big mess. And commoners, according to, to contemporary, you know, uh, historians and poets and writers, commoners, plebeians, disagreed with the senators. They loved Caesar. They loved Caesar because he delivered on his promises. He kept his word because he was so charismatic as a leader. They picked up his body and they brought it to Roman form which is just a 20 minute walk from here where his body was cremated and Apiano da Bello a poet wrote a beautiful poem saying that uh, people this procession stopped and people brought furniture from their homes chairs tables wooden doors uh, whatever wooden fixtures they had in their ho in their homes and when they got to Roman form they made this fire okay so basically just piled up all this wood together and placed the body of Caesar on top of this funeral uh, the, the fire and gave him proper cremation all right so that was the end of Julius Caesar now we're gonna turn we're gonna take a turn right here next block and by the way this here this is Jewish ghetto all right this is the beginning of Jewish ghetto some of the best restaurants in Rome are located in Jewish ghetto. It's a beautiful atmosphere. It's just two, three city blocks. I mean, it's a tiny, tiny neighborhood, but it's worth your while. And uh, yeah, beautiful place. Beautiful, beautiful place. This is the very heart of the old city. And now, I don't like big streets. I don't like crowded places. And uh, luckily, or you know, it, it's it's a very strange time. On one hand, it's of course a tragedy what's going on, and you know, looks like we're almost out of this mess, but not quite. But on the other hand, Rome is empty. All right, the city is empty, so it's the the best time to visit the city. Now look at this. There is virtually no one, and it's still cool. So of course, everyone knows that it's going to be very hot. So people usually the tourists usually you know try to book morning tours walking tours and then by noon they end they stop at a restaurant or bar and spend a couple of hours just resting relaxing before taking another tour maybe in the afternoon or in the evening today it's pretty quiet and this is one of the streets leading to Campo de Fiori of course Campo de Fiori is a world famous place and you know here we're gonna stop here for a second you see these posters we talked about it on the tour of Trastevere because Trastevere is full of them that's Roman way to to express their artistic views or political views uh, or their ideas without hurting the buildings so we have graffiti here that are gonna stay here for a long time and then we have a poster that's gonna go disappear you know with a couple of rains so very very nice thing to do look at this up and a little truck with the scooter engine made by the same company that makes of course Vespa it's probably the ideal mode of transportation 
the door. Everyone loves Roman doors. I mean, these doors, if they could only talk, they would tell a couple of stories. Cobblestones, very tricky to shoot and talk and walk at the same time. It's just a matter of habit. There's a car behind us. This car is way too big for this neighborhood. Look at that. And there's another one. And they avoided collision by miracle. Now look at this. In Rome, you gotta try ice cream. You gotta eat as much ice cream as possible. You're gonna walk it off anyways. Or anyway, I should say. Fata Morgana. Remember this name, okay? It's a chain. Uh, they have like three or four stores in Rome. But they have their own lab, as they call it. Laboratory, okay? Where they make their own ice cream. So they don't depend on anyone. They don't buy it from anyone. They make their own ice cream. Ice cream shops in Rome. Good ice cream shops. Non-touristy ice cream shops in Rome. Open at noon. Alright? And it opens at 11 p.m. So they open late. Now, another place that I want to show you is this Rosciole and I know that you know you know where I am you know what Rosciole is okay Antico Forno close for renovation right now some people say that it's the best some people say that it's not I know that this family Rosciole is a family they own a few stores down here in this neighborhood so it's a good bakery it's a good bakery people say that they make good pasta I've never tried them now. There's another Rosciolo place right here. Let me show it to you. Alright, you see? Rosciolo. It's more like a like a deli right here. Alright? Wine, cheeses, cold cuts and things like that. Cured meats. We have to do that. <laughs> yeah, no, it's not. It's not nice to knock on somebody's door and run, but it's so tempting. I mean, these lions are beautiful. Who knows how old they are? All right, now here we have this corridor that might be familiar to some of you. Right there, and it runs from Ghetto to Campo di Fiore. You know, in Rome we have many corridors just like this one built on purpose to basically facilitate the and reduce the travel time okay for wealthy people for poor people for everyone and once you know where this where these shortcuts are and where these corridors are it makes your life so much easier all right because you can get from point a to point b in a very very fast fast way uh, you know, instead of going down these winding roads that we have plenty of in Rome, you just take a corridor and you go straight. Look at this. St. Barbara Church just tucked in. The sandwich between these structures, these buildings. Uh, this is beautiful. People are finally allowed to eat out, to dine in. You know, so the restaurants are filling up pretty quickly. And this is St. Barbara. Uh, and she must be a protectress of something or someone. You know, every saint has a job. I think she protects wives. Yeah, women, wives, marriages. Beautiful, beautiful place. We have some stores that, you know, we have all over the country selling leather. Of course, Florence is famous for leather, not Rome, but, you know, why not, if you're in Rome, I mean, some of the purses will, will cost you not more than 15 years. Then sandals and shoes, right, if you want to have something really remarkable, handmade, you go to Amalfi, all right, you go to Amalfi, and the same stores that used to make sandals for the, for the jet setters of the 50s and 60s, uh, you know, they will make you a pair of sandals within a couple of hours all right so, and uh, it's gonna cost of course it's gonna set you back a couple of hundred years maybe more but it's gonna last you a lifetime in case something happens you can just mail it back to the store they'll repair it for you and send it back all right 
You see how convenient this is? Straight. All right. This we have to start. Stop here. Cannabis. Now, cannabis. You know, uh, with the THC is illegal in Italy, but t there is no THC. There is CBD. All right, cannabis with CBD. So, just for your information, because many people ask, because of course, cannabis is getting legalized pretty much all over the Western world right now. Well, not in Italy, but it will come. Look at this here. Look at this column. Just incorporate it in the, in the structure. All right. One, two, three, four. Hey, this dog is pretty mad. It's beautiful. All right. So you see, we've got something for both, for the cat people and for the dog people. Look at this here. These little side streets are gorgeous. And this is a very, very close to our itinerary for Secret Rome or Haunted Rome, as we call it now, our ghost tour. We do it in the morning, we do it at night, we do it private and group, and you know, we cover all these venues, all these places. Campo de Fiori, market in the morning. You can actually ask them to let you try things like cheese, cold cuts, oils, sauces, spices. There's fresh, fresh juice somewhere. There's a juice stand, and that's Campo di Fiore. Of course, Giordano Bruno, our friend Giordano, is standing tall, proud in the center of the piazza. And this man here spoke against the church, and uh, you know the incarceration and investigation that lasted for eight years almost. All right, because the guy was just changing his mind on too many things, you know. One day he would say that I want to apologize, the next day he would say that I am right and you're wrong. And at the end of the day, guess what happened to him? He was executed, all right? He was sentenced to a burning alive. And then, like it wasn't enough, they decided to turn it up a notch and sentence him to a slow burning. All right, slow burning means in the morning of February 17 of 1600, he was brought here to this very corner. He was tied to a wooden post and the executioners were told to set the firewood not closer than six feet or two meters to him. And they cooked him for six hours straight. All right, so that's Giordano Bruno. Now, our next stop is... Piazza Farnese and Piazza Farnese is the place of the French Embassy and right now they they had decorated the facade with an artwork artwork of a street artist I think from France well he's obviously a very talented artist and it basically shows you what the palace looked like in the ancient times okay palazzo farnese is probably one of the most important renaissance palaces probably one of the first renaissance palaces in rome uh, and it's a magnificent place inside and out it's a french embassy french have been here forever all right for a very long time uh, but it was built by farnese family namely by uh, alessandro farnese pope paul the third farnese who loved archaeology, who loved history, who loved music. Uh, it took him about 37 years to build this palace. He was named cardinal, by the way, by Pope Borgia, Alexander VI Borgia, because according to tradition, and probably there is there is a lot of truth uh, to the stories here. Uh, his sister, Giulia, Giulia La Bella, Giulia Farnese, painted by Raphael. Uh, actually, you can see her portrait in the uh, Borghese Gallery. She was a uh, best friend, uh, let's say, friend with, uh, with a bit of benefits here and there of Pope Borgia. They actually had four, f four kids together, right? Thanks to her, Alessandro was named Cardinal and later on he would become a Pope. Now, this here is a fountain, impossible to live in Rome without water. And this is a bathtub, all right? This is a real tub from Caracalla Bathhouse. There is one here 
and one on the other side okay but according to to the evidence that we have today this tops were not brought here initially to be fountains but they were brought here to be like uh, VIP uh, sections or seats you know imagine without you know remove the water and put a couple of armchairs inside and tables and it's a pretty nice place to be in you know to watch concerts and plays that would take place right here in the piazza now we have an embassy right here I always forget what embassy is that but it's a beautiful place all right, Cyprus, Embassy of Cyprus. They are renting a uh, couple of apartments here in this building, and it's a beautiful building. I just want to show you something, right? Uh, almost every house in Rome. Hey, look at this dog. Hey, hey you're a cutie. Buongiorno. Almost every house, or you know, big palace like this, big house in Rome has a courtyard, okay? And this is the courtyard of this house. It's green, it's cool, it's quiet, and it's beautiful. And look at the staircase. This, you can tell that this is the staircase of the family that owned this house, this palace. And of course, this here would be the servants, the horsemen, the mechanics, the cooks, babysitters, doctors, teachers, whatever you can imagine, the staff, okay? And every court here is always full of surprises and there is a little little sarcophagus slash aquarium with goldfish and a little turtles right there all right so that's pretty cool so that's what we love and our tours if you've been on our tours you know they're pretty unconventional so we don't like to stick to scrapes or things like that we like to tell it as it is and we love to take people to unknown places now let's see what time it is okay i still have one hour before the tour so we have plenty of time so yeah piazza farnese now we have to get to via giulia all right i wanted to show it to you via giulia is a magical place now let me get to it here you see some construction going on always There's another corridor that goes that way. We're going this way here. The side of Farnese Palace or Palazzo Farnese. And at the end of the street, we have a fountain. Fountain called Fontana del Mascherone. Mascherone probably means a big mask or a big face. People call it Jesus Fountain. Now when, you, when we get there, you'll see why. This here, this buildings here, were probably all sorts of, not probably, but they were uh, schools for priests and such. All right, so religious colleges. Uh, many facades had been rebuilt. Cores of the buildings were kept original, okay, were very close to original. There's a little hotel. There are plenty of hotels here, okay? Plenty of hotels, hostels, BNBs, Airbnbs. So you can stay very conveniently right in the center, right in the very heart of the city. And you don't have to take public transportation. For example, if you're staying here, you know, it's a, literally minutes, you're minutes away from everything, all right? Now, Via Giulia, look at this here. French consulate. All right, now Trastevere is over there, all right? Pontesi, Vatican is over there. And now Fontana del Mascherone, all right, big mask. You see, that's why people call it Jesus Fountain because the face looks a bit like the face of Jesus in icons and artworks. There is no water now, but usually there is water. All right, a very serious soldier came to me and said, don't shoot the, the soldiers, don't shoot the car, the truck. Anyways, we're not shooting. We're not here to shoot the, you know, the strategic uh, places. We're here just to show the city. So, fountain. This is actually a, you know, this place was very, very popular back in the day in the 1700s, 1800s. 
because it was a you know place where you could have water so commoners would come here to get their water then there is a saying not saying but uh, a story of one of the popes celebrating his election by running white wine uh, through this fountain instead of water so you can imagine that it would be you know pretty popular with white wine and then in 1973 uh, a kid 16 year old child was kidnapped from here right from right here he was sitting here smoking his cigarette and his name was John Paul Gotti the third so kidnapping of John Paul Gotti the third a very very loud case you know, his grandpa refused to pay ransom and the kid was kept in the cave like for five months by Ndrangheda. Ndrangheda is one of the branches of organized crime uh, down south in Calabria. You know, so that's the place. You can see this story in movies like All the Money in the World or Trust. All right, Beautifully done, by the way. Shot on location here in Rome. Now look at this bridge. All right, that's the back of Palazzo Farnese. Now I don't want to go all the way to the right because the soldiers are going to come chasing me again. So Palazzo Farnese. Uh, people like Michelangelo, uh, San Galo della Porta, Fontana, they were involved in the construction of this palace. And according to a an old story, you know, you know, I'm, I, I always say according, according to legend, according to tradition, according to the evidence or information. We can never say for sure because it happened so long ago. But we have little hints here and there, you know, that this bridge right here was designed by Michelangelo before he passed away. He was already an older man. And when he passed away, his, uh, his uh, students decided to bring it to life finally and build it. You know, this bridge was designed to connect this palace, Palazzo Farnese, with the villa, Villa Farnesina on the other side of the river. And when his uh, students started building this bridge, they realized that Michelangelo was not a bridge builder at all, all right? By any stretch of imagination, he didn't know how to build bridges. And he made so many mistakes in his plans. So this bridge stops right here, goes nowhere, all right? they were able to build this one span one one arch and they had to call it quits all right now uh, headquarters of the brotherhood of death is on our list next look at this this is something that I love okay symbol of death with the banner you know imagine imagine you do it this tour okay with a family with a group of people and there is there's always one guy or a girl who likes tattoos all right and uh, i'll tell you two stories about tattoos right real quick so i do this story uh, this this tour one summer let's say 2015 all right and then the next summer the same exact family comes back and we have repeat customers of course you know people who come every year and they basically see the same things and we, we which we have to try and discover something new every time we do the tour so uh he comes to me to shake my hand hey dimitri you know how are you doing and how you've been and how the kids and family and he goes look i'm gonna show you something and he basically takes off his shirt and on his back he's got this all right and he goes now you have to explain it to me again because i have completely forgotten what this inscription here means basically means today me tomorrow you all right so guys try not to do things that you don't know meaning of okay there was another story of a guy who tattooed spqr right across his back i mean half of his upper upper back was occupied by this tattoo spqr and he comes to me and says dude i got this cool tattoo yesterday you know it's still red you know uh it, it's so bad and I, I, I love it i love it i love it now you have to tell me what it means <laughs> so you know <laughs> because you know that you see spqr all over the place and it's a very important acronym and actually it means senatus populus que romanus or senate and people of rome now take a look at this one Death has come to claim the body of this poor man, the lifeless body. 
of this poor man, right? El emociona per i poveri morti che si pirano in campagna. So donations for for us to do our job better, basically, all right? For us to pick up the dead bodies from the countryside. So that's what it's all about. This is the the brotherhood of death. It sounds so scary, but it was a very important uh, institution. It was a very important organization. They basically took care of the of the dead. All right, they disposed the dead bodies within the city walls and outside the city walls. So very very important job they did. Oh, Via Giulia continues. Palazzo Falconieri, built by Borromini. You know, we always joke that in Rome, if you want to impress your friends, all right, if you want to impress your friends with your with your vast knowledge of architecture and art, you can basically stop in, the, in any point in the center, you know, close your eyes and just, you know, point at any building and say, hey, my friends, this building had been constructed by a famous Italian, Roman, I should say, architect, Gian Lorenzo Bernini. And you would be 75% right, right? Because, I mean, more than half of the things here in Rome were built by Bernini, were designed by Bernini, or by his school, or by his workshop. But this here was built by Borromini, Francesco Borromini. Palazzo Falconieri for a very important, powerful family. Now, if you compare the two, you know, Bernini was a great self-promoter. I mean, shamelessly promoted himself, okay? All over the place, from Naples to Rome and back. And that's how, by the time he died, and he died in the old age, he actually had designed or built, uh, together with his workshop, of course, over 3,100 works of art, uh, buildings, statues, fountains, piazzas, schools, palaces, uh, whatever you can, whatever you can imagine. Now, Borromini, on the other hand, was a very, very shy man. He hated publicity, and of course, without publicity, you're in, you're nowhere. All right, you will never will get anywhere. And to show the world that he's better than Bernini, although two men started together, they actually worked together on a few projects, uh, you know, to show that he's better than Bernini, he would build things for free, all right, free of charge. And that's something that eventually would destroy you financially. And it destroyed him not only financially, but at the end, you know, he killed himself. He was over 60 years old and he just couldn't handle it anymore and he killed himself or it fell on his sword today it's a uh, catholic university and embassy of uh, hungary at the same time the embassy and consulate are right there and of course it's a property of, of, of hungary well not property but they live here and as we joke very often Pope Julius II, the one who designed and completed the construction of this street, loved basketball. You see, there's a little basket, and people say, you know, this guy must have loved basketball. Oh, yeah, he sure did. All right, so Via Giulia takes its name from the Pope, all right, Julius II. Now, Julius II was a very, very flamboyant, but also violent short-tempered man he loved war okay Pope Julius II was a very very interesting politician very strong man I'm gonna stop here now for a second to tell you a story and we're gonna continue so via Julia by the way all right so imagine uh, and now there is some truth to this story okay but of course, again, it happened so long ago, and uh, it happened behind the behind the closed doors of the Vatican, so no one knows for sure. But the story goes something like that: Pope Borgia, okay, who was not the, you know, who was not the kindest guy uh, ever, you know, who was a ruthless politician as well and a great businessman too, dies. All right, and uh, the conclave begins to elect another pope. And some people say that there was a pope elected. Some people say that the Julius II became his direct uh, successor. Anyways, uh, let's concentrate on Julius II. Julius II belongs to Rovere family, all right? 
Borja Pope, of course, belonged to Borja family from Valencia. And actually, he left seven kids, right? He had eight kids in total. Yes, I'm talking about Pope, right? Pope had eight kids. One of them died under very mysterious circumstances. So now when he died, seven kids stayed here. Lucretia and uh, uh, Cesare are probably the most famous of them. And uh, so Pope dies. His kids are still here. Have uh, They have lots of power, lots of lands, money, connections. And it's time for conclave. So Julius II comes to Rome, as they said, with lots of money, but with no connections at all. All right. So he just threw his name out there. All right. His name was on the table as a papabile or, you know, person who could become a pope in theory. But in fact, you know, everyone knew that he, he's not going to get far at all because he doesn't know any, anyone in Rome. And his advisors tell him, you know what, Borgia's kids are still in, uh, very much, uh, you know, in charge of things here. You should talk to them and you should have them, con you, should, you should convince, you know, or ask them to convince the College of Cardinal to vote for you. Promise them more land, promise them more power and they will they will listen all right so he does just that at the same time he talks with the college of cardinals telling them that listen if you help me get rid of the borgia kids all right and if you elect me pope i'll get rid of the borgia kids and i'll give you all their possessions all right everything they have everything they control will be yours so you see he's double dealing here, you know, playing both sides. And he was a great player because it worked. He convinces the Borges kids to convince the College of Cardinals, who at the same time think, well, you know, we, we better listen to this guy. You know, he knows he's onto something here. So they believe him, everyone believes him, he gets elected, and the next thing he does, he reforms the College of Cardinals and exiles Borges kids. All right, so that's we're talking about a Pope, all right, holy figure. Now, beautiful looking Egyptian kind of uh, columns, probably old. You see lots of old things incorporated in the more, in the, you know, more recent things. Here we have three churches. We have St. Jerome, St. Anne, and St. Thomas right there, Scottish church. Cafe Peru, you know, in Rome, you have to try Roman aperitivo. You see, Cafe Peru, bar tabac. You can buy, you can buy cigarettes if you if you're a smoker. You buy a couple of drinks. One of the one of the most popular uh, joints here in this neighborhood. And uh, you know we have crossed like uh, the neighborhood of Saint Eustachio, all right? Ancient, of course, Rione. All these ancient neighborhoods are called Rioni. And. Uh, Rione Regola now begins here, as Rione Parione is on that side right here. This used to be a prison, all right? This building used to be a prison called Corte Savella. You know, you should know that wealthy Roman families were officially allowed or authorized to run prisons and to run courthouses. And we have a name here. Beatrice Cenci, right there up on this uh, plaque. Beatrice Cenci was one of the innocent souls who was uh, massacred, basically, all right, together with her family for a crime that they didn't commit. The Cenci family, they were accused of, uh, of killing their father, which they didn't do. Uh, the father was very violent, and uh, actually her boyfriend, her secret boyfriend, a blacksmith of their summer palace, killed him. Uh, and the family was accused of murder and executed. All right. Something that looks medieval, but it's not. There's a courtyard inside. Okay. So, as I told you, almost every building, and we call them palazzi, okay? Palazzo is just a generic term for a large uh, apartment building, okay? It doesn't have to be a palace. But of course, some palazzi are real palaces and uh, so yeah every every palazzo has a little courtyard now let me show you this church here okay that's the church where Pope Borgia was buried
it's a Spanish church, all right? It's a Spanish church, and right here, the first chapel on the right, is the place where two members of Borgia family had been buried. We have Calixtus III on the right, and Alexander VI on the left, all right? So both men come from Borja, or Borgia family in Spain. And Borgia family was so powerful that they had produced three popes, okay? It's extremely rare for one family to have three popes, and uh, they did it. Now, beautiful, beautiful street here, Montserrat. Uh, and, you know, I just want to show you the houses here. You know, we have very, very simple dwellings, very simple apartments. And at the same time, we have some important palaces on the same street. And it's, it's rare, it's pretty rare to have this combination, you know, of someone, you know, wealth and poverty in the, on the same street. Okay, we're not even talking the same neighborhood, but on the same street. Now here, up on the left, we have a beautiful restaurant. And look at this here. Another, another arch pathway. Grazie, signora, non c'è problema. È così bello quel palazzo. Grazie. And you see, there is an entrance, and signora moved very kindly to let me take a shot. I wanted her to be in the shot because it's part of Rome. Pier Luigi, all right. If you, if you love food, if you love seafood, okay, Pier Luigi is right here. And it's called Piazza dei Ricci. All right, let me get closer. All right, Piazza dei Ricci, and the restaurant is called Pier Luigi. Okay, excellent food, excellent service. Uh, a bit expensive, okay, but enormous and really good. And this is Piazza de Ricci, all right, Ricci or her family, and that's their house, okay? Very, very easy. All right, let's continue. Ah, and you can feel that, you know, the heat is coming. By the way, SPQR, all right, SPQR is one of the oldest acronyms in the known world, okay? It's older than in acronym ICHTIS, which stands for for Christ, right? The fish, the Jesus fish, as people call it. Uh, so, and again, SPQR stand for Senatus Populus Que Romanus, the Senate and people of Rome. All right, very important. Now, Tiny, tiny houses, okay? They look tiny, but they're not so tiny. I mean, they they go deep into this, into the block, all right? You see, Via de Monserrato is ending here. And Via de Banchi Vecchi begins. Ooh. Oh, we have to, we have to watch out. Lots of cars today. Well, lots of cars for this tiny, tiny street. Let me cross the street, let me show you something else. Suplizio. Italian street food, all right? And that's right near there. Suplizio, cibo di strada. If you love, if you love supli, Suplizio is place for you, okay? I was doing a tour of this neighborhood, private tour with a family a couple of weeks ago. And there was a man from Dubai who flew to Rome with one purpose, right, with one goal, to eat a supli, classic supli, at Suplizio. So you have to try it, believe me. Now another joint that I wanted to talk about is right here, Vino Olio. I always call it Sale Olio, you know, when you have lots of information in your head, sometimes it's really difficult to dig up the right piece of information. So I call it Sali Olio and then when we come closer, you know, it's Vino Olio. Large collection of wine. Amazing atmosphere. And this year, the city has allowed them to put the tables up on the street because 
uh, the space inside is very limited and of course because of COVID we have to socially distance everything so vino olio try it <coughs> rione ponte all right rione regola as you can see let me show it to you rione regola ends here and rione quinto ponte all right neighborhood of the bridge begins here and this plaque is one of this one of the careers is one of the things that we have uh, so many of in the city all right and that's how romans tried to keep their uh, city clean and it dates back to 1741 okay and it says basically that if you litter on the street you will be punished now take a look at this it's not used anymore it's a shame because it used to work the streets were clean you know compared to other european cities rome was pretty clean of course they used the river all right as the main sewer and the main garbage dump but you know you have to you always have to remember that garbage was organic okay there was very little ceramics uh, or glass or anything like that you know it was because everything that could be repaired was repaired and there was no plastic of course so it was all organic so it would disappear pretty you know pretty uh, fast take a look at this palazzo dei pupazzi beautiful beautiful building all right it's a pharmacy now on the ground floor and you see that's the system that ancient romans had shops on the ground level owners of the shops living above and then the tenants upstairs but here of course this i don't think that the owners of this palace had a shop it was a, a pretty important family as you can tell wealthy wealthy family beautiful stucco up on the wall people waiting in line to enter the pharmacy you know the pharmacy is tiny so everyone has to stand outside and wait for them to open so and by the way you see me without my mask on because we don't have to wear a mask outside anymore once one second all right i'm back i'm back and we are almost at the end of the street banki vecchi by the way this this word all right is a very interesting very uh, in my opinion at least very interesting story here you see this the the street that we that we walked on right now and let me get in the shade it's getting really hot so this street right here banki vecchi is full of old hostels okay uh built by german nobility and uh, bohemian or czech uh, nobility uh, for pilgrims okay so this street was the street the main street of the pilgrims because they would walk up the street all the way to ponte sant'angelo all right and cross the bridge to get to saint peter's basilica i'll show you this bridge now in a second and banki vecchi according to the locals that i you know spoke to whom i spoke to uh they all say that banki in this case doesn't mean old benches right banki vecchi would mean old benches but it means old banks all right because there were plenty of banks alongside this uh, this narrow street street uh and of course banks were not this you know financial institutions that we know today that we have today banks were simple simple benches right people would sit on the bench person would sit on the bench on the wooden bench and use this bench as a counter to to deal money you know to buy money sell money exchange money and maybe buy some you know valuables uh, pilgrims had very little money but they might have had something of a value that they could trade or sell and if the clients suspected the bankers all right or these dealers of cheating them or stealing from them or ripping them off they could go to court all right they could bring them before a judge and if they had enough evidence the judge was basically would would close the shop okay now they would 
come, they would send soldiers, and the soldiers would physically destroy or break the benches upon which the bankers sat. And this punishment was called banka rupta, or broken bench. Eventually, it becomes bankrupt. Banka rupta, bankrupt. Bankruptcy has a different meaning, right? The meaning has changed, but the phrase, the term is still there. Bankrupt means broken bench. Take a look at this street. Gorgeous. Every little street here is gorgeous. And I still have 40 minutes. So let's take a let's take a little walk up the street. There's a hardware store, okay? Now, of course, for tourists who come here to Rome, you know, for them it's so, so strange to see hardware stores, to see shopping malls in Italy. Well, Italy is, is a country just like any other country. I mean, we have this stuff, all right? We have to paint our walls and we have to fix our plumbing. So, of course, we have hardware stores. The only difference is that they're tiny because there is not enough room for big stores, right? All big stores are located outside the center. Within the city walls, you know, you're not even allowed to build anything big. Look at this here. I have to point out that there is a homeless man chilling at the end of the street. This pertinent information, you have to know it. Again, another ring, another door knocker. You know, it's so tempting. Yeah, knock, knock and ditch. You know, we have, we have to do a tour like this, you know. Imagine a group of people, 15 people, knocking on the ancient doors and running. Uh, that would be fun. Take a look at this. We're back to Via Giulia, all right? Via Giulia, but from the other end, of course. And here, Vicolo Orbitelli, or alley, or side street, Orbitelli, Osteria. Osteria, very simple. Osteria bar orbitelli. All right, look for something like that. Look for small places. Look for, you know, hidden, tucked away places, and you will have the best experience, culinary experience in your life. Now, what do we have here? Another old building. Well, what a surprise, you would say. Old building in Rome. Look at this. beautiful actually by the if you travel through Vicoli okay Vicoli again are side streets and then you stumble upon a Largo or right? it Largo Orbitelli means a small square you see this all right you see the basically testimony of how the city developed okay you see all these buildings, one on top of the other. You know, it, it just, it's just beautiful. So these, architecture like this, where nothing old is demolished, but rather reused, it, it is, a, is a great example of what was there before our time. Or, you know, we call Rome archaeological lasagna for that reason, you see? because it is a lasagna nothing almost nothing had been destroyed completely and big parts you know big strong architectural elements were usually preserved to be used as foundation for the next generation now you see how beautiful it is we have 20th century 19th century 18th century 16th century 15th 14th 12th century all mixed up together all right and then we have this Citroen Citroen all right old Citroen actually not you know not not so rare to see one it's still in the working in the working order there is no salt on the streets here in Rome so there is no rust and building uh, I mean cars not buildings but cars are usually very well preserved every car almost every car will have a scar or two because the streets are tight parking spaces are tight and you know by the time you're done fixing one scratch one dent 
new one appears so it's pretty much pointless but they don't rust all right they don't rust and it's a good thing now i'm at the at the crossroads here okay so we have the entrance to the vatican hill and the vatican garage right there now aha, the cars are parked so tight that they can't even cross the street beautiful and then we have Victor Emmanuel II and Ponte Sant'Angelo. Now my destination is Ponte Sant'Angelo and that's exactly where we are headed right now and yeah it's coming up you'll see it very soon there are a few bridges here to cross the river uh, none of them are, uh, are actually ancient except for Ponte Sant'Angelo that has been there for a very very long time of course it's been rebuilt modified renovated but the bridge is still there okay now I love courtyards and backyards and let me show you something here this is one of my favorite little passages here There are trees in this courtyard. There is an Azone, another little water fountain. Okay, they shut it off yesterday. I don't know why. Probably future, you know, some some kind of maintenance. There is a fig tree and figs. All right, I wouldn't eat figs from a tree grown in the city but just to show you another fig tree right here they're beautiful and it makes it so so nice and fresh and look at this here all right look at that this isn't it gorgeous i mean here we have 1500 uh and 1500s and 1600s together and it's something new because buildings that stood here before were really really old and take a look at this chapel, outdoor chapel, Arco dei Banchi is called. And we have Madonna, First Virgin Mary, and she is called Madonna del Archetto, or Madonna of the Arch. This slab of marble here dates back to 1276, okay? And you can see it, it says right there M4000, CC, or right, double C stands for 200, CC for 200, L for 50, X for 10. So, 1250 plus 20, 70, V for 5, and I for 1. 1276 all right and it marks something very important this is the level of water in the flood of uh, of 1276 and this what people say all right is the level of water in the flood of 1640 and this ladies and gentlemen is over 160 centimeters tall okay or one uh, over five feet tall that's how high the water got here. All right, now, this street right here, Vicole del Curato, uh, will take you to Piazza Navona, okay? And it's a very, very nice, nice, charming street. Right there, we have the place where we came from, all right, Via Giulia. Banti Vecchi, it's all there, and up there we have this imposing structure, this drum-shaped castle called Castel Sant'Angelo. Castel Sant'Angelo means the castle, castle of the Holy Angel, because 
according to tradition, Archangel Michael saved the city of Rome from plague. No, not plague. Plague. So Archangel Michael saved the city of Rome from plague. All right. You see, it's not a plague. It's not something new. Okay, they they had plagues too, and uh, to thank him, his statue was erected upon the roof of this building. Now, take a look at this. You know, do you think this would be legal today? You know, something like that. The building is is you know brand new by Roman standards. I mean, we're talking 1920s. 1930s but this is something old okay part piece of a portico columns and this is a souvenir shop of a very very high level this is basically an antique shop uh, with very expensive souvenirs and very very nice souvenirs too all right now we have green light we have yellow light or orange light 13 12 11 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, and I'm here. Now, let's take a look at this. This is the selfie spot, all right? Officially called selfie spot because people stop here to take selfies and nothing else. People couldn't care less about the architecture. They come here, take a selfie. Always lift your left foot, all right, or right foot, whatever you prefer to take a selfie, even though the selfie is just of your face. Anyways, it's a different story. They take a selfie of the castle, with the castle, I should say, in the background. All right, Castle, Castel Sant'Angelo, Ponte Sant'Angelo, and of course, Tiber. And Tiber, in summertime, Tiber looks so lazy, so calm. But wintertime, you know, winter when it rains a lot, or snows a lot in the mountains especially, and all the snow starts to melt, the river swells, okay? And it becomes a mighty, mighty Tiber and the water actually rises the water rises pretty high and there's a gentleman coming upstairs he went pee pee downstairs beautiful very nice very nice now the whole world knows who he is all right now don't 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 use rome as a public toilet all right please 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 there are plenty of bars and restaurants where you can ask kindly and people will let you use them now so yeah, when it rains, or when we get too much snow in the mountains, all the snow starts to melt and the rain adds to the water and they feed the Tiber. And the river becomes full, okay, it swells. So you see this couple that went pee pee down there, okay? Water actually rises higher than where they are, okay? The water rises all the way there up to that gate right there. So it's it's not really safe another very curious fact about this bridge is that lots of people fall off this bridge i mean we have one death on average per year and believe me for for accidental deaths okay accidental falls off the bridge is a pretty pretty high number one person per year dies falling off the bridge because people love selfies, so they, you know, they, they sit where they're not supposed to be sitting to take pictures, they get distracted. Their seagulls are huge, sometimes seagull tries to grab a cell phone, you try to catch a seagull and you fall, all right? And I'm not kidding, I'm not kidding at all. Now, it's getting sunnier and sunnier, it's getting warmer and warmer. We are in the middle of the bridge. The castle looks fantastic, I always tell all my friends and all my guests and all our customers to make time on their trip to visit the castle okay don't just come here to take a selfie or to fight with seagulls you know go in buy a ticket and go in go in and explore guys as you can see this castle has two layers all right lower layer and the upper layer and both are open to the public lower layer was built by emperor the emperor hadrian as a as a mausoleum as a tomb of uh, of him and uh, you know for his family and then the upper layer right there okay 
was built, added later on by different popes. The one you see now was built by, or rebuilt, let's say, by Pope Alexander VI Borgia. So we come back to Borgia. In Rome, you cannot throw a stone in Rome without hitting Borgia somewhere, all right? Borgia is everywhere. So my clients will be here, let me check when, in about 25 minutes. We've had a great tour with you guys. I enjoyed walking and talking with you. I hope I provided some, you know, important information or some fun facts that you did not know before. And uh, we are about to end our little tour. I will cut out a few things maybe. Who knows? Maybe I'll add something else. I want to finish this video with this beautiful street musicians and with the view of St. Peter's Basilica.